Hello, everyone. I'm really happy that this is the first talk of the second day of CPPCon. I hope you had, had a good sleep and, and good breakfast in the morning, so you are now ready to survive the talk about templates. My name is Mateusz Pusz. I'm the chief software engineer at IPAM Systems. I'm also the head of our C++ competency center. Um, besides that, I'm a C++ trainer and a consultant. Also, I'm an active member of the IC C++ committee, where we are standardizing right now C++ 20. Today we'll be talking about templates. Uh, I will share with you my experience from um, developing and, and, and designing physical units library for C++. During last month, uh, while designing this library, I found a lot of problems, issues, or uh, some other concerns regarding user experience, mostly, um, about templates, and these are actually valid uh, problems and valid issues that, that arise by many, many users, saying that, for example, compiler errors are so bad and they are really hard to uh, understand and, and, and fix. So we'll be talking about this today. The plan is the following. First, we'll scope on the user experience, uh, current one, and how we can improve it. Then we'll talk about new toys in our toolbox, so what we have right now and what we will get with C++20. And then we'll talk a bit about the performance of metaprogramming techniques. So, the user experience. Um, to understand my background, I, should, I have to introduce a bit my physical units library that I was actually talking about yesterday here, too. But this is basically what I'm trying to achieve here. Physical units library is the library that handles dimension analysis and units conversions. So for example, we would like to have things like this working as it's supposed to be. So if you divide the quantity by, by some value, it's just another quantity. You would like to be able to convert the units, like we know from, for example, stood chrono duration. And you would like to be able to convert the dimensions. So for example, if you will divide the one kilometer by one second, you will have like 1,000 meters per second. Or if you will be driving with a speed of two kilometers per hour through two hours, you will like get, you will, you will reach the distance of four kilometers, and so on. This is what we're trying to achieve for maybe C++ 23. The toy example, something really simple. We would like to create a function that calculates average speed based on the distance and duration provided by the user. Of course, it retrieves the velocity dimension, and the equation is really simple for this case, yes? Distance divided by the duration. So this is what I would like to achieve. I would like to have average speed, uh, provide to it some things like 220 kilometers to hours, and get the speed in kilometers per hour. But also, I would like to provide the same data with miles and get the correct result without any intermediate conversions. So it has to be compile time safe. So if I would do any problem, any mistake in my calculations, it, should be, it, should, it shouldn't compile. You want to support multiple units and prefixes. And there should be no runtime overhead. So it should be the assembly, let's say, or the output, the, the output binary should do the same as we would implement this on doubles, just using the, the plain double type from C. So let's try to implement this with uh, boost units. This is one of the examples that I've shown yesterday. So basically boost units is a library uh, that's pretty common on the market right now. And actually here, as you can see, we made some, some mistake. This is not a velocity anymore. The problem with user experience is the following one. This is the first line of the, of the compilation error. And actually, if you can spot, there are three dots at the end of the slide, because this is not the end of the, of, of the first line. This is the end of the first line. And there are more lines, of course, in, in, in the log, yes? So this is basically what we are striving and what, are the pro what is the problem that I would like to, to address. Uh, of course, GCC may provide big error messages. We know about it. Clank is better, yes? Clank provides shorter error messages. We know about it. So let's see how Clank will uh, answer to this problem. This is Clank. 
This is really simple and really short, yes? But is it better? Do you know what happened? Do you know the context? Sometimes shorter error messages are not necessarily better, yes? Also, it's not only about the compilation experience, it's also about debugging experience. Having such types in IDE, for example, will end up with such stuff in my IDE. So you can see that here IDE claims, where is my cursor here? That basically the type for D and type for T is exactly the same type because it was lost. The ID was lost in the, in the big, huge type that you have to handle. So let's go for GDB. This is the breakpoint for GDB. It's really easy to find out what are the dimensions provided to this function, yes? And also you can try with p-type because actually the, the breakpoint message is actually pretty good because it just keeps the default values for the templates. But if you will run p-type, you will see all of the values. And it's a bit longer, it's one type, yes? Boost units is not, not the only example here, uh, but basically the problems from boost units come like uh, from, from, from the design, yes? I would not go through the design really deeply here, but basically there is a unit, there is a quantity. Uh, there are some uh, structures that define the base dimensions. And we have aliases, alias for the system, alias for the velocity. And this is the reason why we end up with such a huge type on the user, mm, user end. This is an example of another physical units library created by Nick Holthouse, really good one too and it has a lot of users and it's, it's really good, but it has similar problems. Uh, however, the errors are totally different because all of the errors are handled this time by static asserts. We have been told that static asserts are good for user experience, but I would, I'm not that sure about it. This is the error. Mm, there is an information that, user, that the units are not compatible, but we don't have any context here. We don't know what is the unit from, what is the unit to. It's really hard to, to understand what is wrong with the program. We just know that it doesn't compile. So static assets are not, often not the best solution. They do not, over, for, for example, influence the overload resolution process. They are not the part of the interface of the, of, of the function, so it's not that easy to understand what are the compile time contracts for the, for the, for the template function. And for some compilers, do not provide enough context. Clunk here is better, because with Clunk, you have the information about the type rate that was used in this, in this static assert, so, so you have the context right now. But still, do you know what's wrong here with all those ratios being expanded? This is still not the best user experience, I would say. And this is the same case here for, for, for the ID debugging the same type is provided in, all, in, both, in both cases by the IDE. Um, GDB is not wrong, it provides good types, but still it's really hard to understand what are the dimensions being used. Because you have to remember well, exactly which ratio is responsible for which dimension, where is time, where is length, where is mass, and, and so on. And P type, similar. The design? looks like this. We have a primary template that has parameters of all of the base, base dimensions. We have class unit, we have some other help class here, and we have a big alias that basically ends up what we've seen on the screen in the error message. So I would say that there is a need to modernize our toolbox. Uh, for most template metaprogrammings, the uh, error messages are, let's say, rare. You don't break vector or string or other class templates that often, that easily, that will be inconvenient for the users. Of course, if they are broken, they are pretty hard to analyze, but, but you don't break them too often. But there are libraries, and physical use library is one of the examples, where actually there will be a lot of compile time errors. The whole purpose of creating this library is to have many compile time errors during the day because this is the main idea behind this library to help a scientist work with the really complicated calculations. And users will be um, debugging, will be analyzing those errors many times a day and they should be user friendly. Of course, there are probably some other 
libraries that could also benefit from the techniques we'll be talking about today. So in case of this library and probably some others too, we should rethink the way we are doing template metaprogramming. So most of the problems we've seen are due to the tem type aliases being used for all of those uh, primary templates. Can you imagine writing your uh, templated library without alias or type dev as a developer? Probably not, yes? Because it's so really useful and, and handy to use those aliases. However, aliases are quickly lost during the compilation process. And end users actually will not benefit from them at all. Some compilers tend to keep aliases for some period of time, but for example, if you will end the function and move out from the, the template outside, the alias will not be seen anymore. So these are like two aliases that you can provide for the library. Actually, my library tries to make types as short as possible comparing to the other that we've seen already. This is what developer sees, and this is what user sees when you're using aliases. And as you can see, it's still really short in my library because I want to make the best experience possible because the other use cases are the cases like we've seen for Boost or, or other library that you, you will have a type that doesn't fit on one screen. It's really a really pity that we don't have strong type depths in the C++ language. There were a few attempts done during the years. I know that Walter Brown were providing like probably at least four papers on this one for different versions, for C++ 11, 14, and so on. But it didn't end up to the, in the language right now. So we have only aliases or, or nothing else, and this is a problem. If someone would like to work on st strong types for next releases of the C++ language, I would be really happy to help him with, with some thoughts and, and, and contribution. So, for my library, I had to do some workarounds. I use inheritance instead of aliases. The similarity to strong type devs is that basically uh, we have strong types that do not vanish during compilation process. And also, if you type something like an operator equal equal in a base class, it will still, will still work for the child class because we can always cast the child class pointer or reference to the, to the base class. So you don't have to retype all of those operators in the, in the child class by yourself. However, contrary to the strong type devs, we do not automatically inherit the constructors. We have to write this using sentence or something to get the constructors from the base class, and also the assignment operators. We don't get them automatically from the base class. Also, if you have things like, for example, operator plus equal in the base class that return the, the, the type of the base class, it will not return the value of the, of the child class automatically. You have to retype it and, and like overwrite in the, in, the, in the base class, in the child class, sorry, in order to provide your type instead of the base one. So, having this, we have a velocity that's, uh, that, that's actually a, a concept in C++ uh, 20 that constrains the autoduce type. We have the operator division on two different quantities of two, two different units. And we have a, a small problem here. We have here this, from this pre previous slide, this one. We will have length, time, and velocity as a child classes of some, uh, let's say, generic um, primary template. So you have a, a child class, for example, um, distance, length, and you want to end up with velocity here. How to convert the quantity with many types to a child class called velocity. Yes, this is downcasting, not upcasting, so, so the compiler doesn't do it for you, for you, for you automatically. Um, I found a solution for this, probably this is not the best one. It could be improved from probably somehow, or I'm looking for, for, for ideas how to improve it. I called, I called it the downcasting facility. Or it, it could be also some called, for example, type substitution facility. Basically, I'm using the CRTP idiom here, so curiously recording template pattern, that you have a base class that basically stores the type provided by the template, and basically the types that you would like to put under the downcasting facility, you inherit those types 
from this dump class base providing the same type, so CRTP, to a base class. I also provided a concept called dump class table that basically requires that this base, class, base type will be provided in, somewhere in the type T as a public type. And actually that the type T is derived from the, uh, from the, the type of T base type. So of, from that. Next, I have some helpers saying dump cost from dump cost to. And I have dump casting traits that are implemented this way. That basically the primary template of T is just T because dump cost 2 is type identity T. And there is a helper underscore T. How we are using this? This is an example. This is how I'm defining the dimension in my, in my library. Basically, the dimension is provided to dump cast based here with the same type, yes? So CRTP is being used. Then I define the velocity as a child class of some dimension. And then I create those dump casting traits where I provide here dump cast from velocity, dump cast to velocity. So what it basically does here is just a velocity. So this is the result. So if you will find something that it should be velocity. And this something is provided by the, the, by the first uh, element here. So dump cast from basically gives you this uh, alias of a base class here. So and every time you see the, the long template uh, instantiation of quantity, it means that it's a velocity and it will be replaced for velocity with those specific arguments, yes. Of course, with this support, with this feature, you can have only one strong type dev for one specific template instantiation. You cannot have more. So you cannot have like three different types, um, strong types based on the same type uh, that's under, um, underlying one. It's just like a strong alias between specific instantiation of a template and a child class. So the outcome. Using aliases, I will end up with such a long type or with the type like, like boost units does with all of the aliases being expanded. And with the usage of those dun -dun casting traits, I end up with this. And I think this is a huge improvement for, for the user experience. And we really, really, really miss it in the, in, the, uh, in the language and in the current libraries that we have. I hope that when some, at some point maybe we'll be having these strong type depths, I hope that we'll not have to write those dumbcastic traits, but it will be somehow supported by, by, by the language itself, saying that uh, I would like to, to make this uh, type being uh, considered for, for dumbcasting where I see the specific instantiation. So I don't have to write the dumbcastic traits manually every time. I will just provide some during strong type depth definition, some information that this is one-to-one -one correspondence. And, and, and it should be considered for re replacement every time it's seen specific instantiation of a template. The user experience is the following. ID is not, not no longer lost. We know that's a quantity of kilometer and double and hour and double. GDB is a really nice breakpoint right now. P-type also is really nice. And I would say this is a huge, huge user improvement for, 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 the, for, for, for the users, yes. So this is basically um, about the user experience I found out in our libraries. It will make our log error messages much shorter. And people will be much more happy. As I said, we probably wouldn't like or probably we even wouldn't be successful to write our libraries without having aliases and type devs. But they are really fine for develop developers need, but end users do not benefit from them at all. And you should think about our end users while, while you are de developing our libraries. Okay, so let's go to the next chapter called new toys in our toolbox. So let's see what we have right now and how we can improve the code we have right now in the standard library and the other libraries. For example, let's use the ratio because this is the type I'm using in my library for, for conversions. Basically, my library is really similar to std chrono duration, which also uses ratio for multiplications and division operations. 
And basically, so this is why I choose this example here. And it's also a pretty good example. This is how to the ratio is being implemented by most of the compilers. Basically, it has nominator, denominator. They are being stored in the class template as static members. But actually, the values provided here are not stored directly because you can provide things like, for example, uh, one and two here, or two and four. And this is actually the same ratio, but the types are different, yes? So you'd like to have the same values being stored here. That's why the GCD operation is being done, just to store one and two each time, no matter if you provide two, four, three, six, or so on. And actually, those operations are written as another primary class templates and their instantiations. So static sign is another class. Static ABS is another class that is using static sign. And also GCD is another primary class template and, and some specializations, also using another class template here. So you have a lot of class template instantiations in, in this implementation. Alternative, no, sorry, there's also one more example of how to do ratio multiply. To do ratio multiply, you also use like GCD and also something called safe multiply and to make sure that you're not overflowing the, the ratios. These are all the, the class templates here. Alternative that we can do right now is just use concepts. As there's no concepts ABS in the library, I just provided a simple one for this case. And you can just calculate everything as a concept expression rather than using those primary class templates and their instantiations. It's much simpler for, for the analysis. It provides also much better code reuse with the runtime code. And we have less instantiations of class templates. You will find that it's really important when we'll be talking about the performance in the first chapter, third chapter. Also, for ratio multiply, you can also use this STDGCD function and implement your own safe multiply function that will do exactly the same. So there is less class template instantiations. And you can do it right now with C17. Another possibility to implement ratio is the, to use new feature of C20 called non type template parameters. With paper 732, the feature was introduced and it was a bit updated with 1185 that basically provided new information and new updates to the Starship operator. Basically, it allows non union class types to be used as a template parameters. Uh, non type template parameter is abbreviated as NTTP and we'll be using this later on during the presentation. And those types that can be used there are required to provide stru strong structural equality, which means basically that the uh, operator equals, uh, equality operator will be defaulted by the compiler and there will be no floating point types. So in C17, for example, you can write the code like this one, seconds for fixed timer, and for C20, for example, you'll be able to use chrono. This is only one of the examples here. And let's look into our ratio, what we can do with it. Oh, there is one more yes, slide, sorry. Uh, so basically, GCC uh, is the only compiler that supports right now the non type parameters. It's supported from GCC 9.2 in, in a good way because there were some bugs in 9.1. And as this is a new feature, I expect that the quality of implementation will improve over time, of course. Also, there are some controversies regarding NTTP. There is a paper called 1837 that basically by Arthur Rodwire that, that provides some concerns regarding this. So I'm not sure if it will end up in C20. Uh, that is why right now my library didn't merge NTTP support for, for the mainline. I'm waiting for the Belfast meeting to find out what will happen with this paper from Arthur. Yeah, and let's see how we can implement our ratio with, with NTTP. We can create a simple class. This is not a template class anymore, it's just a regular class. It has two members, and it has a constructor that does exactly the same as the previous concept mm, implementation of ratio. It also has this defaulted uh, equality operator that is mandated to use, to use it as an NTTP. And ratio multiply can be implemented easily by multiply operator. 
with the same implementation that was used for the Consex implementation in the second case. Also, we can benefit from, from some other syntaxes here. We can provide operator multiply for just in, in, integer values, easily, which was not possible to achieve for, for, for types in previous two cases. So this is how you can use it right now. You can say that this is ratio as a value provided to, to, to the unit class. And with the additional two functions, you can easily say that you are dividing ratio here by three, by 12, or multiplying by, by this value. So this is the benefit of having different multiply operators and don't have to write uh, things like ratio, multiply, and, and so on. It's really convenient. And, and I think this, this is really a huge gain for, for template metaprogramming. So, before, my division operator was looking like this. And actually, it's looking like this on the main line because I still didn't merge my NTTB branch. And with this support, it can look like this one. It's shorter, easier to analyze, and easier to implement. Also, if you consider that dimension could also be a value, you can end up with this. Which is much, much easier to write, analyze, maintain, and so on. To make dimension a value, we have to make two structures that have value types. Exponent, dimension, <coughs> and then we can form a velocity in that way. Uh, why I show you those, those, those classes here? Because uh, those classes are meant to be used only in compile time as NTTP types. They shouldn't be used in runtime because they don't have any sense for, for runtime. These are meant to provide only compile time context for metaprogramming library. Having consex classes here make them possible to use at runtime. People will start to use it because you provide the ability to, them to, to use that. So for example, if you would like to change something like this, for your metaprogramming revision two, you would not be allowed to do it because of ABI, for example. And you cannot break ABI because this is what, what, what currently we are striving in this ISO community that we all sometimes prefer ABI over fixing bugs, better functionality, or even, perfor even performance. And I didn't want to play with ABI at all. This should be a compile time only type, yes? Actually, its code should not be visible in bin binary at all. So I will not have any problems with, with compilation time. Uh, compilation, like, 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 like the, the API and, and, and what's compiled there. So what, what, I can, what I can do? I can use a new feature of C++20 called immediate functions, so const eval. With const eval, all of those functions will disappear. They will not be put into binary. They will be used only in compile time context. But actually, C++20 does not allow us to create const eval objects yet. I hope it will be added to C++23 because it will be a huge gain for NTTP. And with this, you say exactly that this, time is, this type is only valid for compile time analysis, compile time evaluation, and there will be no binary code from it in the runtime. So from my experience, and also from, from experience of other people here, for example, Hanna Dushikova yesterday said that NTTP is her favorite feature of C++20. Uh, I think that, that NTTP will imp really improve our template metaprogramming techniques. And, and basically, uh, it's something to consider every time you are working with something that should be a value but was a type because of previous constraints, of previous releases. Another feature and another tool in our library are concepts. How do you feel about this code? Do you like this interface? Probably not, yes? We are laughing from this for many, many years. This is C, yes? But really, how much this one is different? It takes everything. It returns something. It's, it's actually the same, nearly. Maybe one will fail in runtime, another one will fail in compile time. But actually, user has the same problem. User doesn't know how to use it and what it does. 
Also, we have lambdas. Is it, is it different here? I would say that unconstrained template parameter is a void star of C++. And I think we can do better. Concepts are coming, and really this is a huge benefit for the user and for the, for, for the implementation of libraries, for the interfaces. Really, it, it have, has a lot of benefits. So let's see. Concepts uh, are things that are constraints. Those constraints can be assigned to any templates we have, so class function, a variable alias template, or even non-template functions of uh, pr mostly primary class templates. Those constraints are the requirements on template arguments, so what template argument should fulfill in order to, 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 to be valid. And they are often used to select the best, um, best function overload or template specialization. And concepts are actually the named sets of the requirements because you can provide requirements without naming them. But if you name them, it is a concept. So concept is a named predicate that is evaluated at compile time. And what's really good here, this is a part of the interface of a template. So this is not some static assert put in the implementation of the code. It is part of the, of the, of the signature of the, of the template and everyone looking into header or, or Wikipedia or, or cppreference.com will find out uh, what is actually the type here and how it should be used. So let's see an example from my library. Let's write a function that calculates a fine for speeding. Yes, we have a velocity here and we return price. Velocity can, can be further to quantity of, velocity dimension, Quantity of can be, has to be quantity. D has provided here as a velocity has to be dimension. And actually the dimension stored in the quantity has to be the same as D. Dimension is an empty class because it's just a type list in my case. And as you've seen, it downcasts from, so basically it's, it's dimension. So this is this downcasting facility, so I check if my dimension is actually inheriting from downcasting facility. And quantity is some type rate that I can check if, if it's quantity really. These are all named concepts and they improve our interfaces a lot. But you may claim that concepts are syntactic sugar to enable if void t basically sfine that we have right now, yes? And many people claim that. I would say it's a, a lot more. First of all, they are easy to use, easy to write, easy to understand. So this syntactic sugar, yes. But there are more options here. For example, we can easily constrain the function return types with, con with concepts. Try to do it with Sfine. It's not that easy or impossible. Uh, we can constrain the variables that user have in, in his functions. So automatically the deduce the, the type can be constrained saying, I don't care what is actual unit of this velocity, but it has to be velocity. And it's really easy to constrain template parameters. It was possible with Sfine, but then you have to uh, provide additional template parameters here, like type name equals enable if, type name equals enable if, and so on. But then if you're looking into the compiler errors, instead of two types in a, in a template parameter, you will have like four or five which again makes the analysis of compile time errors and user experience worse. With concept, you have, you, you have everything clear and easy here. So it's much more than just a syntactic sugar, in my opinion. And I really recommend using them. Oh, by the way, if you're not familiar with the syntax, this is a template function, yes? This is a generic function that will be provided in C++20. You know about generic lambdas because we have them from C++14. So every time you see auto in lambda, there, it, it means that there is a template involved. And this is the same for the generic function. This is exactly the same syntax. And nearly everywhere where you can use auto in C++ language, you can constrain the auto, me, meaning the deduce type, with concept. It, you can put concept in nearly every place besides structure bindings. Only structure binding is an example where you cannot constrain with concepts right now. All other cases where it's auto, you can put the concept name before it saying that this that this type will be constrained with this concept. 
There are a few concept categories. We, as an ISO committee, on last meeting in Cologne, uh, found out three categories of concepts. There are predicates that basically state what the type T is. There are capabilities saying what type T can do. And basically, capabilities really often end up with able suffix, like here, swappable. There are abstractions saying what this type looks like, what operations can be done on this, and, and this is like bidirectional iterator or, or I don't know, uh, Sentinel or something like this. But actually, I found out that there are four categories instead of three. We did discuss this in ISA committee, and I don't know if it's a good practice and if everyone will agree with me, but from my experience, this is a pretty good practice to use fourth category. The fourth category here are the family of instantiations. So, for example, you can provide concept ratio for its ratio type trait, which is just implemented as a, any instantiation of ratio. The only problem here is naming. As you're probably aware of, on the last meeting in Cologne, we just renamed all of the concepts to the lower case. For the first three categories, we didn't have that many name collisions, but in this case, when you have ratio and concept ratio, how to name one and another to know which one is concept, which one is a type. So I would really still like to have this uppercase syntax, but we just lost it two months ago in Cologne. And we have to find out now how to name the concepts for such instantiations. But from my experience, this is really, really useful stuff for interfaces. Just to say that, that it returns you a quantity type or ratio type or duration type, but I don't care what its actual, actual instantiation. It's really, really useful. So, some examples to, to, to prove that, that this is useful. When you have ratio multiply in the standard library, Right now, this is type name T, type name U. And you can put everything there. Of course, if you put something like that ratio, it will blow up, blow up in the user, user face, yes, in the, in the error message. It's good to say that we want to put ratio here because this function works only on ratios. Another case is my quantity. I have two upper parameters, and I would like to have unit here and scalar here. I don't want, for example, someone to put quantity as a representation, so I will have quantity as a representation of quantity. Right now, there are such checks in stood chrono duration done, but they are done as a static asserts in the implementation of the, of the type instead of the signature of the, of the template. So this is basically something that's really helpful, in my opinion. Talking about the user experience of computation of concepts, let's see the same function, the same error that we've seen for Boost and, and other library. I don't know if you've ever seen how concepts fail to compile. This is, this is how it looks. There's information that the operation D multiply T doesn't mean the constraints. Constraints is velocity. And actually, at this point, you could just end up your analysis because you know that it was meant to be velocity and it's not. If you want to make sure or understand why it's not velocity, you can go and see how it, it's constructed. So it's saying that this part, same as, is failed and same as it's implemented as same TU and same UT. And basically there is information that's same, that U is velocity and T is that type, and they are not the same. Because it's expected that velocity would be minus one here, and then the caustic trace will make velocity from this. This is how concepts uh, help with user experience. This is still error from the GCC, which is, it implements concepts TS. And it's still experimental support. I expect also quite of implementation to improve over time, both from the performance and, and error messages point of view. But this is already, already, already pretty good, in my opinion. So benefits of using C++ concepts. First of all, we clearly state our design intent. If you go to cppreference.com or you will find some documentation from Doxygen, you will exactly know what, 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 should, what, are the, um, what is the interface of the primary template and what should be provided there. If you see type name T and type name U, you don't know what, what the architect wanted from you. 
yeah, they are embedded in the template signature. Uh, they simplify and extend Spina functionality. So basically, it's much simpler to disable specific overload, uh, contrary to enable if. It's much easier to detect if you have member types or member functions in a type, contrary to void t. Uh, we don't have to provide dummy template parameters for primary class templates to do some, some Spina on them. And also we can constrain function return types, we can constrain user variables, and probably some other cases too. Everywhere where an auto can be used, you can use constraints. They greatly improve error messages. First of all, they raise compilation error before entering a function, rather than in a compilation error somewhere deeply nested in the stack of this function implementation, internal implementation. It's typical right now that you will find out that the compiler complains that something didn't compile and it's like 10 stack functions from the function you called. And you have to analyze how the library is implemented to find out if this error comes actually because there is a bug in the library or maybe you just provided a bad type to, 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 to the function template. With this, it's clearly stated because there is no instantiation of the functions. You, the check is being done before instantiating of the, of the template. So, let's move to the third chapter, performance. For performance, I'm using the tool from this guy, you probably know him, this is Louis Dion. He started a Metabench uh, project together with his, with, his, with his Boost HANA library in 2016. He put a lot of effort, and also other guys, contributors, put a lot of effort to this in order to make it what it is right now. Right now, it's a CMake module that you are using for, for compilation. Um, it can be used to precisely verify only a part or maybe one line or maybe only the instantiation of a function template to find out what is the performance, performance um, characteristics of this, of this part of the code. So you can exactly say what part of the, of the file you are compiling has to be benchmarked rather than compiling and, and verifying all of the file. Also, there is a metaben.ch meta website where you can find detailed comparison of several MPL algorithms from different libraries that are implemented right now in our open source software. So you can find out which libraries are the faster the fastest for specific algorithms, and then you can go and find out how they are implemented and what, what techniques are being used. Probably one, right now, the fastest one is written by Odenholms, and it's called Quasio MPL. So this is how you're using this tool. This is CMake file that you, are, that, that you are creating. You basically provide a data set saying that you want to compile this CPP file, actually is a Ruby file, Look, looking like CPP, and this is the, the input data, so this is the range you would like to, to, to provide for benchmarking, and some name for the, for the line on the diagram. You are putting more, li more lines, and you are, you're, then you are aggregating those lines as a chart, saying that this is the name of the chart, some subtypes, and what should be the lines on the, on the chart. Talking about Ruby, this is how this file will look. It's looking like really typical C++ code, and only you provide some special loops from Ruby, saying that you can um, create this test structure n times, n times is the number provided here, and basically how it, it will be instantiated in case the benchmark is on, and what to do in case of benchmark is off, because creating an alias also costs, so you make to make sure you're not, you are not um, benchmarking here, how, what is the cost of, of this, creating this alias, but what is the cost of instantiation of this ratio only. So if I have alias in both cases in order to make sure that my base uh, data is, is the same. This is the output from the generator. Basically, uh, it provides the structures from one to n. Of the, of, the, of the implementation from the, from the Ruby file. This is what I'm doing for, for types, and this is what I'm doing for NTTP. 
for NTTP, I'm just comparing this to creation, creation of bool with value false, for example. So I'm comparing how much more expensive is to create this ratio NTTP rather than and the really simple bool variable in a, in a, in, in a class. So this is the result. This is the result of, of operation performance. This is for multiply and divide operation of, 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 of performance. We've seen multiply on the slides, divide is really similar. Uh, each one of them has only one multiply and divide, and this is the number of operations. This is the stood ratio implementation that we've seen on the first case in our implementation. This is what most of the current um, implementations of the standard library do, with all of those primary templates being, being expanded. This is the second case that we analyzed with most of the implementation replaced with context functions, but still we are working with types. And this is NTTP. It's much faster in this case. However, NTTP also has its own problems because this is for, for multiplication, but let's see what happens when you're analyzing on the deconstruction of NTTP. Here we have the 42 seconds for this amount of, of elements. Here we have only two seconds, so it's much, much less. It's 20 times less, so it doesn't influence the overall performance, but when you're analyzing only the creation part, we see that NTTP actually is much slower to create than typical templates right now. This is because we have constructor. This constructor has to be simulated in compile time. That's a constructor rather than just initialization of, the, of, of, of some variable. And simulation of those, of the stuff, of the constructors, overload resolution, and other stuff in compile time is, is hard for the compilers right now because they don't do JIT any, they, they do not JIT anything right now. They're just creating AST and simulate the abstract machine of the, of the, of, of, of the C++ runtime during compile time. If you've seen Hannah's keynote from, from CPP now, Hannah exactly said the same stuff. The, there, is, there is the concept problem. They are slow, and they are really slow. For, she's using a lot, a lot of context and NTTP stuff for, for her um, regular expression library, and these are the times she ex found out from GCC, Clang, and PHP for the same implementation. We hope that compiler vendors being pushed by people like Hannah, Louis, Odin, or me will find out some, some ideas to speed up execution of concepts during compile time. Maybe there will be JIT, maybe there will be some other solutions. I hope the, the uh, performance of, of, of this stuff will, of context evaluation will, will improve in the next releases. Also talking about the performance, there is the rule of chill. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I've heard about it first time two years ago on Code Dive conference in Poland where Odin Holmes came and he said about chill those his uh, intern that he had in his company. This guy, approach the uh, template metaprogramming from, from the empirical, from, 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 from the technical point of view, he started to benchmark the, uh, um, what are the, or trying to find out what are the key uh, ingredients to the overall performance, performance rather than just benchmarking the, the end result. And what they found out is that the cheapest one is just uh, looking up a memoized type by the compiler. Compiler remembers your instantiation, and you are, if you're instantiating, instantiating the same type again, it will just remember what it did already. Right now, it's not true for concepts, it's not true for NTTP. I hope it will also be, and concepts too. It's not, 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 it's not, it's not true for concepts. And the second fun thing is adding a parameter to an alias, adding parameter to a type, calling an alias. So actually, aliases are the fastest things we can do right now in template metaprogramming. Instantiating a class, instantiating a fun function template, and Sfine. This is what they found out, and based on this, they created this quasi-library, which is the fastest right now on the, in, on the market. So this is the typical example from, from Odin, Odin talks, 
This is a typical implementation, for example, of conditional. It has three template parameters. Boolean, that says which one should be selected. This is the true case, this is the false case. And there, you, the, the type is stored here. There is, uh, this is the implementation for the, for the true part, this is the implementation for the false part, and this is helper. You can implement this with alias templates. You can implement this in this way, that basically you will separate the condition for instantiation, this is the condition for false, this is the condition for true, and selection of the type. With this, for all of your application, your, all the library will have only two types, two, two specializations, for true and false. These are generated for every case you are using. True, false, and, 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 and the condition. Here, you have only two instantiations, for false and for true. And they will have a lot of just using aliases inside for different cases you are, you are testing. As, as we've seen on the rule of shield, aliases are the cheapest one to, to, to have. So the performance of it is as follows. So this is the typical implementation that we have right now in the standard library. And, and this is one uh, provided by, by, uh, by Odin. And this one actually is the one where, where I call it without this, this convenience helper. Just putting this template, this ambiguator, every place in my library. Because this alias also costs. Yes? So if you want to cut the cost, you have to have this nasty template, this ambiguator in your code. But it actually, actually makes also some improvement here. The thing that was missing in the rule of chill Oh, sorry, there's also a graph for GCC, for, for Clank. Frankly, Clank is really similar, but faster, by three seconds. The thing that is missing in Rule of Chill, because they analyzed it like a few years ago, is the performance of variable templates. This is something new that was introduced in C++14. So I would like to show you also another use case for, for example, the same type trait. This is the typical standard implementation of it, based on the specialization of the primary class template. And the convenience help helper that we are using often in our code, yes? And this is how you can do it with variable template. This is shorter and faster. This is typical implementation that we are having right now, based on the class templates. And this is the one, mm, yeah, this is the one where you are using the primary template without the convenience helper. So without this, it's the same. So this convenience helper actually costs a lot. And this is the variable template. This is for GCC and Clank. So you could ask me what about C++ concepts, yes? I said that they are really, really fine and good for the user experience and for the interfaces, but what is the performance of concepts? What I found, they are not too expensive at compile time. This is good. I don't have much bigger yet experience because I try to not make such micro benchmarks, but uh, verify my whole library. Mm. Actually, I found out that there are two possibilities to use concepts. You can either put concepts everywhere or you can put them only there when, when they are needed. So this is the example where they are needed. When you have a primary, temp type, primary class template definition, you need to provide a concept. When you have here the definition of the alias template, you have to provide a concept. But every time that you're writing like some, some internal implementation, for example, you, you don't have to provide the concept here because it's your, this is your internal stuff. And this was basically this dimension divide detail was already verified here. So you don't have to recheck it here, yes? Also, if you're instantiating, providing some partial specialization of this dimension here, you know that it was already checked that it's exponent while this dimension was created. So you don't have to provide once again information that this is exponent here. Because you know, because otherwise dimension will not be constructed because of this constraint. So this is the possibility to, to not provide concepts everywhere, 
and save some performance. The graph I got is 200 times of creating of doing make dimension with no concept at all, with concepts only in the interfaces and concepts everywhere. As you can see, it's like 10% of the performance, so I would say they are, they are not really influencing the performance and the, there's a huge user experience benefit from this. This is not the same case as in previous cases because all of the is same and conditional implementation were exactly doing the same. Right, and right now you have a huge value added here, yes, to have concepts. And as you can see, from my experience, you don't pay too much for them. And still, as I said, this is experimental implementation from GCC for concepts TS. I expect the performance of the final product to be much faster. I expect concepts to be memoized, the same as they are memoized for, for class templates. So, and they are not as I understand right now. So I expect the performance to improve even more. So please do not be afraid of the concepts performance. Try and play with them, because they make a huge difference for the, for the users. If you want to know more about the performance and how to implement fast metaprogramming libraries, you can go to MetaBench website, see the graphs for different algorithms like sort, find the list of the libraries being tested, find that Quasir in most cases is the fastest one, and basically even though those numbers are smaller here, they are like this only because the graph ends here, because otherwise the code will not compile for MPL, or will take a lot of time to compile. So being faster than MPL right now is not an issue. Takeaways. First of all, when you are implementing your template metaprogramming, do not think only about your developer's convenience, think also about the end users and how they will be interacting with the error messages and, debug and debuggers with your library. Even if you are not writing a library like me that will throw a lot of errors in the user face every day, you should think about it a bit in order to make a good user experience. I hope that at some point we'll have strong titles in the language and the problem will disappear because both we and the users will have a good, user, the good, good experience of template metaprogramming stuff. Use C++ concepts to express your compile time contracts, to improve productivity, to improve compile time errors. Use non-type template parameters. When a template parameter actually represents a value, Stood ratio should be value from the very beginning, but we didn't have NTTPs at, the, at this time. Optimize compile time performance. There is more than one way to do it in C++. There are some techniques that may make the same code be compiled faster. Remember about rule of chill? Try to use variable templates. Prefer aliases rather than class instantiations. And basically, that's the end of my talk. Are there any questions? Yes? Yeah, so the question is if I'm aware of a um, comp compiler profiler created by Steven Watanabe, so the same guy that created Boost Units. Uh, actually, I'm not. I never heard about it. Yeah, there's actually a microphone. If someone wants to ask a question, there is a microphone in the, in the center of the room. Mm -hmm. So I have a very... Is this on? Have a... So uh, the, the question was, uh, 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 his tool uh, enabled us to analyze our meta programs uh, 
like a real pro profiler would do, not just the end result, like how, how, how long does it take to compile a, a translation unit. But we could see, even back then, how much the individual templates cost us. It, uh, so my question is whether you know, is there any other, a, new, a newer tool like that, th that can tell you, okay, so in this translation unit, you've instantiated this template 100,000 times, so it's, this is your compile time bottleneck. Uh, besides having, having the meta bench, I don't know if there is an another tool, but as I said, meta bench may be used just to verify only the parts of the code. So if with this, if they have this macro, you can you can easily select the code that is being verified for for compilation time. But otherwise, I don't know about an, another tools right now for for, for the analysis. Okay. And we have time for the last question because the session is nearly over. Very quick question. On the slide before, you had a definition of ratio where it computed the GCD, and then you said using type equals ratio of and some parameters. Doesn't that create an infinite loop? Because every instantiation of ratio does using type equals another instantiation of ratio? Um, I don't think so. I took it from DCC, so, so it works. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we are really out of time, so if there are any questions, please find me during the break, okay? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm.